of worshipers. But do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. So in this verse, as we kind of start breaking this down, um, there's specifically uh, spoken about, when it's talking about measuring this temple, it is referencing a temple that will be built during the time of the tribulation. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this. The Jewish people, would, uh, they'll erect this uh, temple. Again, uh, and we have this kind of takes place up to the midway point of the tribulation. The word temple in the uh, Hebrew is the word hekel, H-E-K-A-L. Um, it actually means big house. That's got a little different meaning for you and I, right? Whether you of M or maybe uh, you work at a big house. But um, the uh, Jewish people would like to build a temple right now, but there's a problem. There's something in the way. Another temple, a mosque, in fact, and it's not there to worship God. It's there to worship Muhammad. And so most of you uh, probably know this. We got a picture we'll put up here for you. Um, this right now is uh, one of the biggest uh, roadblocks to the Jewish people building a temple. Uh, this is called the Dome of the Rock. You've seen it in the news. Uh, it's a temple with a big gold dome, obviously. Uh, that's an Islamic temple. Um, to those of Islam, it's the second most important holy site in their uh, belief. Um, the number one being Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia. And um, again, there's a reason why the Jewish people want to rebuild the temple in this spot. This is believed to be the very spot that Abraham offered Isaac uh, as a sacrifice. But then obviously God intervened and there was a ram caught in the thicket, right, that was sacrificed. That was Mount Moriah. Um, it's believed that that's where this took place. Uh, King Solomon built the first temple by God's direction and design there. And um, then after that temple was destroyed, um, uh, Herod's temple uh, is what it was called, but again, it was still a temple to worship God, was erected, and it wasn't quite in all the glory of what Solomon had built, but again, it was there. And so for the Jew, this site and the temple being there, it means everything to them in practicing uh, Judaism. <laughs> Um, understand they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. So I know you, you kind of know that, but again, to help put it in perspective, you know, they believe everything of the Old Testament. They do not accept anything of the New Testament, the New Covenant. So to them, Jesus, good man, they might go as far as to say prophet, but not Messiah. They're still waiting for Messiah. Therefore, it's imperative for them to have a temple and to continue to practice all the sacrifices and all those things that were put into place from the Old Testament in fulfilling the covenant they believe that God gave to them. All right? Um, in the book of Daniel, um, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, came to Daniel in a vision, and he explained some things to Daniel. And I'm going to put the passage up here. I want to read it because it's very fascinating because it's really, uh, Daniel was given again something prophetic of future and it ties right into this temple. So Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, this is what Gabriel told Daniel would be future events. And again, this was obviously a message from God. So Daniel 9 27, the ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. Talking about seven years, the tribulation, seven years, okay? But after half this time, so three, you know, half to seven, three and a half, my math doesn't have to be that great. That's, that's, you know, as far as I could get in school with that, I understand that. After half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. So in order to put an end to sacrifices and offerings that are being done in a temple, there has to be that temple where this is all taking place, okay? And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So all the way back, Old Testament, 
Again, Daniel being given future events that will take place, this is talking about, or just to give you more Bible about why there is going to be a temple that will be rebuilt to allow the Jews to continue the Old Testament sacrifices and practices. This ruler is going to come on the stage. He's the Antichrist. He's going to promise peace because remember the tribulation, you know, uh, saints are raptured out. There's chaos. There's all these uh, signs and judgments and all these things that are cataclysmic <clears throat> things that are happening. He's going to come in, kind of calm everything, promise peace. And what more of a way to help promise peace than to somehow broker a deal to where the Jewish people get a temple at this site. Now, whether both mosques end up being there or whatever the case is, it doesn't matter. Um, they will have a temple. And so there'll be the lull of peace or promise of peace, but then halfway through the tribulation, he's going to, in that temple, where again they're offering sacrifices to God, he's going to come in and have this object of worship. He's basically going to claim he is God, right? That's what's going to happen in this. And he's going to demand that all of the earth worship him or be killed. That's what's going to happen, all right? So obviously it will change from peace to that. Um, understand that when those temple practices and everything begin, this is not a thing of God in the sense of while they believe they're doing it to worship God, God gave the instructions for the tabernacle. He gave the instructions for the first temple. He even gave the instructions for the second temple that was rebuilt. This is not of God. This is of man, right? And it's the same way man's always been. Man wants to do things their own way, right? And so that's what always gets man in trouble. So this is actually done in rejection of the Son of God because, again, they're not accepting Christ as the Messiah. Um, Jesus said, you all know the words in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Right? So that's why we are so uh, purposeful in preaching a gospel that's not based on works or anything of man. Right? The only way is through the Father, right? So, um, I didn't plan on going here. I'll go here anyway. <laughs> Being a Catholic's not going to get you in. Being a Lutheran's not going to get you in. Being a Baptist isn't going to get you in. Methodist, I can go through them all. Being a non-denominational isn't going to get you in. It is, did you get in by the way of the Father uh, through Christ, Right? I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father. You can't get there unless you receive and accept him. <clears throat> Bottom line. I didn't say it. Jesus yeah. said it. Right? That's the way. We must approach and worship God his way, not man's way. So let me just kind of stop right here because we're going to transition here in just a second. Let me give you just a little bit of life application. All right? We gather as a church to worship the Lord. And we do so out of command and encouragement. The Bible says, Hebrews 10, 25, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Isn't it amazing that you, all of you would agree, we are closer to his return than we've ever been, right? Many of us were, were brought up just believing it would happen at any moment, and that's not changed. It can happen at any moment. But yet, church, things of church, that has kind of gone away to where that's not the mainstream in America anymore, right? America is not one nation under God like it used to be. We all know that, right? So, but again, the Bible tells us now that they, the day is returning, you need to meet together even more. To encourage one another, which makes sense, right? Because you got a world that is saying the complete opposite. So believers ought to be together more to encourage one another in these times that we're in, right? And so while we worship God here in this place, we also worship God every day with our lives, our actions, talk, work ethic, attitude, dress, pleasures, hobbies, 
relationships, friendships, all the things we do. It reflects Christ in us. The Jews want to build an Old Testament temple. You and I as believers are the New Testament temple. The New Covenant. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Look at this real quick. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. And then 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we're the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. And then in uh, chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that spirit that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. You are the temple of God. We gather together as the called out assembly body of Christ, but understand that together you're the temple, and as you leave this place as individual believers, you are the temple of God. And so wherever you go, he goes. Whatever you say, he hears. Whatever you do, he sees. Whatever you think, he knows. And so it comes down to what kind of temple of worship are you, right? All right, we're going to transition. Revelation 11, chapter 3. This gets really interesting, intriguing, fascinating, and bizarre. All right? I love it. I love it. Verse 3, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap. Think uh, Gap or Vogue or Amber Crombie, any of those, because they have the, the burlap line. <laughs> <laughs> and will prophesy during those 1260 days. 1260 divided by average month, 30 days. Um, it's 42 months, so you do all the math, three and a half years. All right, talking about the same, three and a half years, three and a half years, three and a half years, all right? God will send two witnesses. They will proclaim his name. You won't find them on TV, sandwiched between infomercials late at night. Everything they speak, proclaim, will be in the news because it will be the news. I promise you. You'll see this as we start reading some of this stuff. At the beginning of the tribulation, again, as the uh, believers were raptured out, God will bring judgments and signs that will grab the attention of people. And again, he's trying to show them that they need to turn to him before it's too late. And God will not only bring these judgments and the signs in the sky and earth and everything, but he'll bring these two witnesses to testify of him. And his pending eternal everlasting judgment. Now, you might have right off the bat the thought of why these two witnesses? Why? Well, what does the Bible say? I'll give you, it's not up here, Second Corinthians 13, 1. Um, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. That's why you often hear me say that Scripture supports Scripture. So whenever you have somebody that just pulls something out of Scripture, it's completely out of context, or it's just one area, Scripture will always support Scripture. God, because of his word and what he's given, and he's established, this is actually talking about a case, a trial. When you have an accusation against somebody, you don't just go off rumors and gossip, which is how the word world tries people, right? <laughs> but you must have at least two or three witnesses that are in agreement before you can pass any kind of judgment whatsoever. God is fulfilling his word. He's giving two witnesses on top of the witness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're getting five. <laughs> and again, he's fulfilling his word as this case for Christ is made. All right? Revelation 11, verse 4. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. So we have to go back to the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 4. These are mentioned, again, in the Old Testament, again, prophesied about them coming. So listen to what Zechariah chapter 4 says. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on each side of the lampstand? And what are the two olive branches that pour out golden oil through two gold tubes? 
Don't you know what he asked? No, my Lord, I replied. Then he said to me, they represent the two anointed ones who stand in the court of the Lord of all the earth. So these two are going to be lights in a dark world. The world's going to be rejecting God, rejecting Christ, and they're going to stand there, and, and we can go into the, the olive branches and the oil that's, again, connected by these two. It's, it's basically saying they will be continually filled with his spirit, right, as they proclaim his message from him. That's what it's referencing there. They're going to preach and prophesy about Christ and his coming. So then what you want to know is who are these people? Who are these two witnesses, right? Anybody curious? Maybe. Some of you don't even know to be curious. All right. So the book of Revelation does not tell us specifically, but there is scripture that at least, in my opinion, identifies one of them. And so I want to share that with you. Again, it's just kind of an intriguing thing. But uh, again, I think you'll be fascinated by it. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Old Testament. The Bible says this. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. That seems pretty clear cut. Mm -hmm. Could that be symbolic, Elijah? We'll, we'll get to this in a second. Or is it Elijah? To me, it seems pretty clear cut. As far as I know, Elijah hasn't been set yet. That dreadful day hasn't happened yet. As dreadful as any day the world paints, I promise you, when God decrees the dreadful day, you'll know it. All right? And so Elijah's going to come, again, according to what the Word says there. It seems pretty clear Elijah's one of them. Look at Revelation 11, verse 5. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. Don't you wish you had that now? I know you do. I know you do. Just, man. Well, we don't have that. Thank goodness, right? These two witnesses have power to bring fire down from heaven. Uh, remember, Elijah's already been there, done that, right? Prophets fell, sacrificed, fire came down, consumed the sacrifice, all the prophets were killed no one's going to be able to hurt them they will be immortal while all right i know i got a southern twang in that important while we'll come back to that there's application in that for you and i while they fulfill god's purpose during this specified time revelation 11 6 they have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have uh, the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. The book of James tells us that Elijah prayed and it rained not for three and a half years. Isn't that interesting? Three and a half years. Three and a half. Three and a half. I'm telling you, God knows what he's doing in scripture, right? Because you don't understand when you read doesn't mean there's not understanding, right? We have to have that mind of Christ through his spirit, right, speaking to us. So clearly, I believe scripture, and I can be wrong about this, people. This is this is not a this is a what I can this is a non-essential thing. If it doesn't end up being Elijah, it's okay. All right. Salvation is not weighted on the identity of these two witnesses. Salvation in that time is weighted upon the acceptance of the message. That they're given and preaching and proclaiming, right? So I believe, though, Elijah's pretty clear from Scripture. The other one is not as clear. And there you can make a case for a lot of different ones, but it's been suggested that Enoch, um, remember, Enoch was translated. He's here one day, gone the next. Um, that it's possible it could be him. You know, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. And so Enoch was never killed. Because he just went up. Elijah was never killed. He went up in a whirlwind of chariot of fire, right? So that kind of, it's like, wow, well that, it should be them. Because then they're going to experience death here in a second. We'll talk about it. Um, but you have saints that are raptured out that don't experience that death too. So, you know, that may not be the definitive argument that it's Enoch. Um, 
It could be him. It might be Moses. The authority to produce plagues was given by Moses. Again, obviously, in favor of the whole thing about Egypt. Um, and maybe some of those things that we just read, they're very similar to some of the plagues. So maybe it's Moses. You can make a case that at the Transfiguration, when they witness Jesus and then uh, uh, Elijah and Moses, right? Well, then maybe it's Moses. And those are the two witnesses, again, with that being referenced about the transfiguration. They represent the law and the prophets. So you can make a good case with that. But again, whoever it is, I promise you, the world will know that they are from God and that they have the message of God. There'll be no doubt about that. And again, their message will be to turn people to God. Many will, but however many will not. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them, and he will conquer and kill them. So this beast is the Antichrist. We'll talk more about this when we get into chapter 13. He's against Christ, everything has to do with God, and the Son of God, obviously. And when these two witnesses have finished their purpose... They fulfilled their mission. The Antichrist will come up against them and prevail. Seemingly. All right, we'll get to that too. Life application number two. Let me read you. Tim LaHaye wrote this. He said, when they completed their testimony, it says they will be immortal until their work is done, which can be said of all God's servants who walk in obedience to his will. Listen, there's a reason why you as a believer do not have to walk in fear, but should walk in faith. Because you are untouchable until God is finished with you here, your purpose. You understand that, right? So, obviously I'm not saying that things won't happen to you. They do, but you have a God that loves you, protects you, has purposed you, and knows, right, the, the number of hairs on your head. If there are any or not, right? <laughs> he knows all that, and therefore, he knows your days. They're numbered by him. And no one can touch you, no one can take your life from you until God says, that's it. Right? So listen, walk in some faith and victory as a result of that. Right? Right? Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. Their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where their Lord was crucified. So there's no doubt here, this is Jerusalem. All right? Verse 9. For three and a half days. Here we are, three and a half. God likes that number, three and a half. All peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. Verse 10, all the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who have tormented them. Now keep this in mind. you got all this going on. We've got this ruler that's come on promising peace. Right? The world's in chaos. People vanished. Cataclysmic events, all these things. Somebody comes on and says, hey, we just need to have peace. He gets the nations together. He gets the, he gets the Jewish people and the Islamic people and a lot of denominations of faith together and has peace. And it all is great. And then these two witnesses come on board and they muck it all up. You can't stop them. Somebody crosses them and they're just vaporized as they proclaim the message. Again, they're from God. They're sent by God. Again, keep in mind the Antichrist is just spewing out lies and getting a world to move and believe just false things that are inaccurate. But you have these two witnesses that are proclaiming the truth and the world can't handle it. And again, they're, they're sending plagues of their own. They're stopping the rain. They're doing all this kind of stuff. And so the Antichrist comes up, kills them, 
They lay him in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, and there's a massive world celebration. People, the Bible says, exchanging gifts because these two troublemakers are dead and gone. Now, there's something interesting. I won't read it. If you want to look it up later, you can. In Esther, chapter 9, when the Jews, it was being schemed for them to be annihilated, and God intervened and ended up killing those that were going to kill them. He empowered the Jews to do so. The Jews exchanged gifts for three days after all that happened. So I think this is kind of like Satan's mimicking once again you exchange gifts, I'm exchanging gifts, right? I've killed yours. Now, you know, years ago, a lot of preachers or even people, you know, you kind of get have to get past many of our lifetimes, but, you know, before TV, before social media and all these kinds of things, when it talks about, you know, well, we'll get into this verse, but the world witnesses and sees this, they would have said, how would that be possible? But you all know now how it's possible, right? You, you know things that happened in the world before the news media finds out because of social media and everything else. And so, to me, it's, it's just always great that that just shows you how accurate Scripture is, right? Before man knew how to do this, God knew and knew it would be a thing, right? Because he's God. And then, as weird as this sounds that these two witnesses are laid in the street for viewing for three and a half days to prove that they're dead. Uh, some of you will remember not too distant history that Saddam Hussein's sons were laid in view so that there could be verification for everybody that they had been killed. Remember that? People, they'll be happy. They'll be exchanging gifts cheering it'll be a holiday for three and a half days the world of unbelievers during the tribulation will celebrate the death of god's witnesses and then look at revelation chapter 11 verse 11 but after three and a half days god breathed life into them and they stood up terror struck all who were staring at them then a loud voice from heaven called the two prophets come up here and they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched at the same time, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. 7,000 people died in that earthquake, and everyone else was terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Don't you hope you get to see that moment? That'd be cool. Three and a half days, all these people celebrating parades, all this stuff, and then all of a sudden, these two guys stand up. I don't know whether the world here has come up here. Probably not. But just they stand up, and it's just like, that's it. They just, you know... Verse 14, Revelation 11. The second terror's passed, but look, the third terror is coming quickly. Third terror is coming quickly. Obviously, we don't have time to get in that today. We'll get back into that next week as we continue here at Revelation 11. But I want to give you a couple of thoughts, things that we talked about, some of the life application here, and then we'll be done. Speak, our text here talks about two witnesses that declare the Lord during the tribulation time. You are God's witness today, right? You are God's witness today, so it becomes what kind of witness are you? Paul declared Romans 1, 16, 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You are God's witness. What kind of witness are you projecting? When people see you, spend time with you, are they seeing a witness of God? Are they seeing someone that is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Are they seeing someone that understands the power of God through his word, through salvation to anyone who believes? Are they seeing a person of faith? Are they seeing a person of faith? As the world falls apart, do you fall apart with it? 
Now, you don't have to respond, people. I'm not looking for response. Your silence says everything. <laughs> <laughs> World right now is in chaos with what Putin's doing over in Russia, right? It's tragic. I'm telling you, he's evil and wicked, right? I promise you, unless he turns himself over to God, he will give account for everything he does, right? And we should pray for him. Yeah. We should. The man needs Jesus, right? Yeah. He needs Jesus. But listen, these things happen. Other things happen. That I don't want to get political, but all the things that happen, do you fall apart with the news? Don't fall apart with the news, people. That's not faith. That's not reality. You are a believer of a whole different reality, a reality that is truth, a reality that has victory, a reality that, listen, is going to come to pass. And there's nothing that man can do to stop it. You and I are being asked to listen, be the witness that believes, and be the witness that declares the truth of God's word, the power to salvation, right, for those that believe. And then listen, along with that witness, as we talked about, you're the temple. You are the temple of God. You don't need a building. That doesn't mean you don't come. We're supposed to assemble together. Right? Encourage one another as you see the day approaching even more, right? So that's not the, I don't have to go because I'm the temple. I can worship God wherever I go. But you are the worship of God wherever you go. Be careful where you go. Right? Be careful what you say. Be careful what you do. Be careful what you think. Be careful of all those things. God says, I'll destroy this temple for anyone, or I'll destroy anyone that destroys this temple. Some of you, many of you, all of us, we're our own self-destruction with the temple, right? Listen, you're God's temple. Be a temple that worships him. You are a witness today. You don't get to be one of the two people. Sorry to let you down. <laughs> But you are the one he has today to use. What kind of witness are you? That's your bag is. Where Chris can come forward and play. Listen, as he's playing, I just want you thinking those two things. Listen, if I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, Christ himself makes clear that I am the temple. He lives within me. First, I have to ask, do you have Christ living in you? Have you ever had that opportunity or taken that opportunity to receive Christ for salvation? If you haven't, listen, you can do that right here, right now. Just simply pray and ask, tell Jesus, look, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you, you sent your son. I, I don't understand it all, but you sent your son to die for me, to save me from my sins. The Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This could be the day that you become the temple of God. Just simply pray. Just pray with me right now. I can't do this for you. This is you. Just pray to God. God, I'm asking you to forgive me for my sins. I know you sent your son to take my place. I believe you came, you died, you resurrected. I believe your word that you're coming again. I ask you to save me right here, right now. So if you prayed that prayer right now, no one looking around, just raise your hand so I can see. Just I want to pray for you. See that hand, I see that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. That's an incredible decision. Listen, maybe you're here, you're a believer, but it's like, man, when you talk about me being a temple, that doesn't reflect my life. When you talk about me being a witness, I'm not the best witness. I want it, but I have it. And listen, take some time to talk to God and just say, God, 
do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I want to be a witness for you. Let him reveal his truth to you. You draw to him, and he will draw to you. Father, as we come to you in this place, God, we, we go through this, and God, there's so much in your word, and God, obviously you reveal your truth to us, and, and yet there's still so much we don't understand, and God, some of it just seems crazy and bizarre, and, but yet we know it's true, and we accept it, dear God, even though we may not understand it. But God, the bottom line is you have given us a those of us that are alive right now, you've given us a purpose right here, right now. And a, a purpose to live for you, a purpose to be a witness for you. God, a purpose to, to live by you in faith. And not just for ourselves, but your God, but for others. Family, friends, children, grandchildren, generations. To witness that faith that we live out so that God, they will have an example of living it out also. God, let us be that kind of witness that makes an impact, not for pride, but for your glory. And so that others, dear God, will believe as well. God, we thank you. We ask your goodness on these people and you continue to speak to hearts. Pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Learned something a little bit today. Kind of fascinating, right? Some of you, maybe you've heard that about the witnesses. We'll